Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here with me again. Let's just go ahead and, and jump right into it. Uh, tonight, I want to look at three aspects of Christ's life and his ministry. You know, we hear the saying a lot, I want to be more like Christ. I want to walk as Christ did. I want to be like Jesus. Well, tonight we're going to look at three major aspects of the life of Christ. Prayer, preaching, and patience. Now, I'm so glad you're here with me. And I am excited to bring this to you as much as I am to get into it again myself. So I hope you brought your Bibles and I hope you'll follow along. I hope you'll comment if I'm wrong, if I've missed something, or if you just want to have a discussion. I'd love to hear from you. Before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. O Lord of Lords and King of Kings, holy is your name. Father, forgive us as a nation, as a church. Have mercy on us, for these are trying times, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would be with me tonight as I bring the word and the message that you've given me, and that the Spirit would move me aside and speak through me, and that these words would not be my own. Please, Lord, bless these, bless my lips as I bring your word. Forgive us. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. First piece of scripture we're going to look at is, and this section is about prayer. Now, we know the Lord separated himself a lot to pray. He went off in the morning. He went off to a solitary place. He was always separating himself to spend time with the Father. And we need that. But what I'm going to drill, out to, drill on tonight is how he prayed. Here's the problem. I feel like too many of us pray, but too, not very many of us know how to pray. We don't know how to pray. Not saying that there's one cookie cutter way to do it, but we don't understand what it means to pray and commune with the Almighty. So I don't want to get too off on anything before I read the word. Let's, let's go and get into it. John 17, 6 through 25. Now this is a big section I'm going to read. I think it's important and we're going to talk about a couple things. I have revealed to you, to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know, now they know that everything you have given to me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through you, through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name and the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except for the one doomed to destruction that the, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and I, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that, that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them, 
even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Praise be to the Lord, the God of heaven. So, I was picking up on a couple things as I was reading through our Lord's, as he prayed for his disciples and for the future believers. One of the major things I was picking up on in there was unity and to be one. We have a lot of divisions in the church already, not to mention different denominations that splinter off from the trunk of Christ as though one, one section has something that the other section does not. We're all unified under Christ. We all preach the same thing. Justification through Christ. Salvation through his blood. There is only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone is all about Jesus. And it will always be about Jesus. So it seems as though if we could unify under that one statement, all for Jesus... We would have a lot less divisions, but that is not how it is. The devil knew what would be more beneficial to him. It is not to completely destroy the church, but to splinter it off and to have so many divisions that they're unproductive. Now, if you notice, I know there was a lot there. I know I read there was a, there was a large section, and it's going to be hard to kind of pinpoint on all the different factors, but I wanted to read it. I wanted you to hear it. Now, there's a part in here that says, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. I am not saying that you should not pray for your unsaved neighbor that the Lord would have mercy on him. But how often are you praying for your brothers and sisters? How often are you praying for your children that the Lord may bring up a spouse for them if it would be his will that they marry? Are we praying against the evil one? Or is our prayers just to bless food and just to ask uh, uh, with a Hail Mary prayer that grandma don't die. How are we praying? Where is our heart in it? Now, I wanted to talk about prayer, and I'm probably going to spend a lot of time on this because it is, it is starting to become almost non-existent in the church except in a very traditional and religious way. There's a stop time and a start time. Don't pray too long. People have to go to lunch. And not only that, but we don't give an opportunity for anybody in the congregation to stand up and pray. Prayer is one of those things that we've been given that has been such a powerful weapon that we do not use. And as we look at Christ's life, he was always trying to go to a solitary place and pray. He was trying to have that intimate time with the Father. Are you having that in your day-to-day -day life? Is your life too busy that you can't spend 15 and a half an hour, an hour, two hours on your knees weeping and mourning over the sins not only in your life, but in the life of the church, in the life of your family? Is that too much for you? Is your day so busy? As a believer, I speak to believers. Every, day, every time I preach, I preach to believers. Is it too much to commune with the one that created you? The created, giving praise to the creator. If by some crazy means you feel that your life is so important to you that you can't kneel before the Almighty who gives you the breath to have the life that you now feel is too important to ever spend time with him. Are we that bold? Are we that prideful and arrogant in our own ways that we can't spend five minutes in prayer? to thank the Almighty for the breath that he gave us today is, is as though it isn't convenient. I haven't really made time for it. Let me ask you something. Have you made time to breathe? Have you made time to blink? Has your heart made time to beat? Then surely you can make time to bend your knee and pray to the Almighty who gives all of those things their beat, their flutter, their pumping, in their speech. Let us not be 
so caught up in the world. And that's what it said. That's what the Lord says, right? I do not ask that they be taken out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. We're here because the Lord wants us to be here because he's placed the salt in a dying world and we are to be the light. But how can we go if we can't, if we can't even incite the Lord, if we can't even get in his counsel? How can we go if we're not sent? And how can you know if you're supposed to be sent if you don't go and pray? We must pray. We must. Not only individually, but as a collective. What is, it, what is the constant word here? As one, unity. They may be brought to unity. I'm going to tell you, be brought to unity in prayer. Now, the Lord was speaking here about unity of one mind and one thought and one spirit. And I, I'm not taking anything away from that. But as to speak to you today, can we not at least become one in prayer? Can we not in agreement for the sick, for the needy, for the sins in the church? Brothers and sisters, this is a grave concern of mine. That we don't understand what it means to truly be spiritually minded. We do not battle with flesh and blood here. We battle with the principalities and the dark forces and the demonic and those that practice all such things. Do you think you're the only one that prays? Do you not think that the other side and their followers do not pray and pray with fervency? Come on now. Come on. You know they do. And they're dedicated. The other side, the pagans, are more dedicated in their prayers to their false gods than we are to the one true God. Shame on us. The whole lot of us. As though our religion and our traditions are enough. We must repent of this and get back to God. We must. To protect us from the evil one. Now, that's also in the Lord's Prayer. That's when he's teaching his disciples to pray. He asked that they would be delivered from the evil one. Do you think by your own will and strength that you can resist the devil? That you can resist the flesh? That you can resist the world? By your own means, do you think you can do those things? If you answered yes, then you're a prideful person that should repent of that. Not by a long shot can you do those things on your own. You must put on the full armor of God. You must be in prayer. You must send your prayers up to heaven for the strength that only comes down from heaven. Be long-suffering. Be long-suffering in prayer. Weep in prayer for a dying world. Are you truly twisted in and torn up about the world that you reside in? Do you look around and say, boy, I'm really grieved. In that grief, go get before the Father. Go cry out to him. Will he not hear his children? We must be spiritually minded. We must look unto Christ as our example. And when we must, most importantly of all, if you do not hear one more thing I say tonight, hear this. We must be obedient. If we're told not to lust, we shall not lust. If we're told not to worry, we shouldn't worry. If we're told not to fear, we shouldn't fear. We must do these things to be obedient. Now, am I telling you that you will never sin? No. And I'm not telling you that I'm standing before you as a sinless man because I'm not. I'm a sinner. But we must be conscious. That is the thing. A conscious effort of obedience. Not a sluggard's effort. Not a slacker's effort. A conscious effort to obedience. It must be a conscious day-to-day -day thing where you are actively being vigilant to be obedient. It is difficult to do the right thing in the day we live. And it has always been from the beginning of time because there is resistance from the other side. 
It is like having a, a giant elastic band tied around your waist and attached to the wall. And as you run, it pulls back on you and tightens. But you must resist and keep running. You must resist it. And you must not tire of doing good. Let's move on. Let's continue on. <clears throat> Next section I want to talk about is preaching. Matthew 4, 17. Would you go with me there, please? I don't, before I continue on, I don't want you to feel that I'm always beating on you. Like I'm always just really giving it to you and, and telling you what you haven't done and, and how you've fallen short. I, there are a multitude of preachers that preach the soft stuff. And I'm sorry, but there's more of a need for the harder things than there is for the softer things. Everybody's very familiar with the love and the grace and the joy and the mercy that comes down from God. Those are all very true. And those are all very real attributes of him. And I want this to be very clear. But his wrath and anger and punishment and chastisement are also attributes of the God you serve. So please understand me. I don't want you to be discouraged. I don't want you to be downtrodden. I don't want you to cast your face to the ground and say, well, then what good is it? I can never do well enough. We can't. And that's why we need Christ. We are to do our best with the strength he's given us, with the task he's given us. To follow him. And therefore, we will be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect if we walk with Christ to be blameless before his sight. So, let's read Matthew 4, 17. One verse, but powerful. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That's it. That's the message. That's the preaching. Now, the Lord did a lot of other things. He did a lot of miracles, a lot of healing, a lot of teaching, a lot of exhorting. Uh, he, he did a lot of things. He did a lot of rebuking. But I wanted to focus on his preaching and what he was calling people to. When he went out and when he sent the 72 and when he sent the 12, what was their message? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. Understand one thing. The message is small and simple. The application is much more difficult. Because there's a dying to self. There's a reflecting of life. There's an understanding that the ways that I would like to go might necessarily not match up with the way the Lord wants me to go. And therefore, I have a choice. I've come to a fork in the road. There are now decisions that have to be made because I can't have both sides. That would make me a hypocrite. And hypocrites are cast out. They are outside of heaven where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. You cannot be a hypocrite. So you have to choose. And this is what we're talking about with the preaching, right? Repentance. Repent. Acknowledge your sin. Understand that you're a sinner. And then you must turn to God. Those that brought you the message, myself or, or wherever you are, the people, the true followers of Christ, the kingdom goes with them wherever they go. We are to be the salt and light. And the Lord said he'll always be with us. And his spirit goes ahead of us and goes within us and gives us the strength to do the task he has laid out for us. Those of us that preach a message of repentance, we weep. Because it, a lot of times it falls on deaf ears. And you know, I don't think enough people weep if they truly understood what it meant to be covered in sin before an almighty God 
and how he looks upon that and how he sees you when you are not covered in the blood of his son. A wretched soul you are in his sight. But he does not want anyone to perish. So here is the good news. If you still draw breath, you still have time to repent, be converted, and serve him the rest of your life. There is the good news. There is the joy that should fill you that if you still draw breath to this day, there is still an opportunity for you to turn around and say, you know what? I am wrong. And I've lived for myself for the past ABC years. And I realize that all that will be waiting for me on the other side is God's cup of wrath poured out in full. For what does it say in Romans? All of the two that reject are storing up for yourself wrath for the day of wrath. The books are being recorded. Your life will be laid bare. There will be no one there to explain any of it away. It will just be you and the creator of the universe. And there's no explanation you can give. Your entire life will be laid flat. Then what will you say? Didn't you want me to be happy, God? I often wonder if people have been bold before the Almighty like that. They've come to the end of their life and they have just still in prideful anger, arrogance, stood before the counsel of the Almighty and spoke with such bold words. I couldn't even imagine it. But as I bring you this repentance message, at least this particular section of it, I want you to understand something. This is a daily thing to repent. We have daily struggles. We have hourly struggles. We have marriage struggles. We have job struggles. We have children struggles. We have government struggles. Repentance is a daily thing. It's a self-reflecting daily thing. It is not once in, once in a year at Easter or at a New Year's service or one time you went to confession at a Catholic church and you felt like, hey, you've got your ticket. You've been fooled. You have been fooled. And that false sense of security will terrify you right before you die. I want us to understand this very clearly. We get but one life. We can either live for Christ on this side of eternity and die to the world. Or we can live for ourselves on this side of eternity. And die for eternity on the other side. I want that for no one. I will not wish that upon my greatest enemy ever. I want no one to have to experience that. But the truth of the matter is, the road is broad. And the gates are wide. And many are those that are on it. So I hope through this ministry on YouTube that somebody, somewhere, heard a message, not, only, not from me, from someone. And they were convicted. The Spirit drew them. And they had a soft enough heart to respond to the kingdom that had come near to them. Because there's no guarantee that the Lord will ever deal with you again. So if you hear his voice today, do not harden your heart, but repent, for the kingdom of God has come near to you. Let's continue on in our, our, our message for tonight. The last message, and, and it's, oh, it's so, it's so needed in my own life. That pre I, I, I say this to you, I preach to myself as well. In these messages, it's not just for you as though I have it all together. I don't ever want you to think that. Oh, preacher man, he just, he talks to me like he's got it all together. You, you couldn't be farther from the truth. I have my own struggles in life. 
I deal with everything you deal with. If not more, sometimes it feels. I have struggled with sin just like you have. I have been fooled by religious tradition just like you have. I have sat in the pew Sunday after Sunday and then lived for myself the rest of the six days just like you have. But I finally came to a place where I said, no more. No more. I want nothing of this life. This life has nothing for me. It's empty. And it always leaves you wanting. Don't just hear the word, but do the word. Be obedient. Get that tonight from me. Don't just be hearers of the word. Be doers of the word. Once you've repented, continue on and live for the Lord. John 20. Uh, next piece of scripture we're going to go to is John 20, 24 through 31. Okay. 24, John 20, 24 through 31. Okay. So this is the passage about Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and, the, and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the door was locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But this, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, this last section we're going to talk about, right? Patience. Oh, how the Lord had patience with those that were his. Oh, his unfathomable patience with them. And this is something that I wanted to bring up, right? Thomas spent the, Jesus' entire ministry with him. He was one of the twelve. He had went with Jesus from town to town and seen him do all these miraculous things. He had heard all the words that Jesus said. And here he is, after all the words that Jesus said had been fulfilled. He's in the room, gathering with the disciples, fellowshipping, breaking bread. And they come to him with this exciting news and they say, Thomas, we've seen him. He's risen from the dead. And he says, mm -mm, nope, there's no way until I physically lay my eyes on the God-man. I will not believe you. And I'm sure they were all perplexed, but Thomas, he said he was going to. Don't you remember? As you walked and talked with him and fellowshiped with him, he said he would rise on the third day. Sorry. I have to put my hands on him. And then Jesus came to them, a second time, and Thomas was there. And I'm sure in his eyes and mind said, this cannot be real. And Jesus comes to him and says, Thomas, touch me. Put your fingers in my hands and your hand in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus could have easily come into that room and said the shame on all the lot of you. Look at you here, cowering, when I told you all these things beforehand. And you, Thomas, you were with me. And you still couldn't believe even after your brothers told you. 
He didn't say any of those things. He had every right to. But the Lord is so gracious with those that belong to him. Is he not? Amen. So gracious. He goes to Thomas, right? He goes right to him. Thomas didn't tell him these things. Jesus already knew what he said before he even, he wasn't even going to say it. And what does he do? He comes to him and repeats exactly what Thomas said. Touch me, Thomas. And believe. Now, there are people in our lives, brothers, sisters, that have tried our patience. We have explained many things to them. Maybe it's a child. Maybe you were a Sunday school teacher. Maybe you're a preacher. Whatever the case may be. And they've walked with you and they've talked with you and they've fellowshiped with you. And you've explained all these biblical things to them and how they should live. And then you get the call one night that somebody got pregnant. Or somebody was found drunk. Or somebody was caught in decent exposure. Or somebody ABC. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And this person pries on you because they knew. They knew. They walked with you. And, they, and, and, and therefore they walked with Christ because you are in Christ and Christ is in you. And so as you proclaimed the gospel to them, they received it. And you discipled them. And they strayed. And that perplexed you as it's perplexed me. Then your patience was tried. And right here we're given an example of how we're supposed to deal with those that doubt and stray. Or maybe uh, you wouldn't say Thomas strayed, but his faith, he doubted this. He doubted that Christ was going to do what he said he was going to do. And ultimately, the actions that are taken after somebody knows are inevitably, are inevitably saying, I'm going to sin willingly because I don't truly believe Christ is going to do to me what he said he's going to do. And that's a terrifying thing. But we must have patience with them. Because who are we? People that the Lord had patience with. We were the same. We were caught in sin. We were chained to it. And the Lord longed for us. And he went and stood near to us. And he battled with us. And he sent his spirit to convict us. Day after day after day. And he had patience with us. Because he's what? long-suffering. He suffers a long time for us. We ought to do the same. We ought to do the same. I implore you, whether it be a husband or a wife or a child or a brother or sister in Christ, or a pastor, or a Sunday school teacher, or somebody that uh, led a Bible study. Have patience with them, as the Lord had patience with you. We cannot think ourselves better than those that are either uh, struggling, having doubt, or are going astray, because all of us could put ourselves right in their shoes if we were honest with ourselves. We must have patience. I want to, I want you to know that we must not think of ourselves higher than what we are. Because it's an easy thing to do once you've received the truth and you start getting in the word. It's easy to kind of set yourself up and say, well, I know better, more than you now. I know this now. Why aren't you getting what I'm getting from this? You should be where I am, and now I don't have patience for you anymore because you don't have the diligence that I have. And what we've done is we've become arrogant and self-righteous. And I preach to myself because I've done these things. I don't want you to fall into that. I don't want you to slip into all these traps that are so easy to fall into for Christians. Pray and preach 
and be patient with one another. Now, not everybody is called to be a preacher uh, uh, of sort of sorts is what I'm doing or your pastor, but all of you are, are called to be ministers, to go out wherever you are. Everybody should be missionary minded in your workplace, in your family gathering of unbelievers, wherever you are, you should be speaking about the goodness of Christ. Remember that going forward. Remember what we've learned here today through the Holy Word. Prayer is so essential. Always pray without ceasing, day in and day out. The preaching of God's Word is powerful because His Word is sharper than a double-edged sword. And his word will not, will not go out and return to him void. So there's the promise. Not only will it cut, but it will produce fruit. And be patient with those that are, that are struggling. With those that are still maybe haven't received an understanding like you have. Be patient with them. Be patient with your husband and wife. And be patient with your children. Let us all go forward and be the example of Christ. I love you all. And like always, God bless.